Um, though remote sensing is a recent addition, it, what we're doing, it builds on the research that the center's been doing for uh, a number of decades and hopefully moves it in a direction where we can do some of the kinds of investigations that we couldn't do before and um, get some answers about uh, prehistory. So, before I begin that, why can't this person? Um, let me familiarize you all with the area. Has, who's been to Cancel before? Let me ask that. I should always ask that first. How do you know you? Okay. So, uh, Cancel is located in the lower Illinois River Valley. You can see uh, that on the map with some of the better known mound sites uh, highlighted on it. And basically, it's about the last 70 miles of the Illinois River. Uh, it's associated valley uplands um, and the sites therein. And, of course, what is well known for are the Middle Woodland or Hopewell Mounds that were built there beginning in the Lower Valley around 2,000 years ago. And that went on for about uh, 500. You can see an example there. We're going to talk briefly about that. Now, this is just to give you a frame of reference for the time period. And our, the main thing I'll be talking about is Middle Woodland, uh, maybe a little bit about Lake Woodland. There'll be some speculation about that. But the Middle Woodland period in the Lower Illinois Valley generally uh, begins right around uh, 50 BC, give or take, rather than 200 BC as is normally noted uh, for the Central Valley. Okay. Um, so when people began migrating into the Lower Illinois Valley, it was uh, abandoned for a period of time, they start burying their dead on the bluff crests in these mounds. And these mounds tend to have a very distinct sort of structure or architecture to them. If there's one thing that you leave with today, or one of the things I'd like you to leave with here today, is the idea that these aren't just big piles of dirt, that these are architecture, and that many of them are planned in a very distinct way that's replicated across the valley, or up and down the valley. You see an example, a section of one, uh, at the Peak Clunk site, Mount 2, on your right. And you can see the diagrams of that profile, and then a plan view of the, I forgot that I have a pointer. You see the mount here, uh, illustration of the profile, and then a plan view showing one crypt and two. The basic steps and components of mound building in the lower Illinois Valley, uh, we, I, we summarize as this, is the initial footprint of the mound, this is the earlier component of it, uh, is that Folks, they clear the original surface, often taken off the A horizon, or the organic grassy layer, tree stumps are burned out, activities like that. Oftentimes, there's what we call a prepared surface, where uh, clean, uh, debris-free soil is deposited in what would be the original initial footprint of the mound here. And then uh, we have the building of the rampant tomb complex, where you have this tomb, a log tomb, often roof. You can see it here with these ramps, and these would enclose the whole, or encircle the whole um, log tube. Sometimes they're built out of loads of socks, which are scooped up and piled uh, upside down or inverted, which gives it this distinct sort of loaded pattern here. Um, for some period of time, individuals are buried in these central tombs, often with um, Hopewell items, fancy goods, copper um, items, pipes, uh, exotic raw materials, mica cutouts, what have you. Uh, individual in these tombs are often, except for the last one, are bundled or removed and deposited elsewhere in the ramp. Um, other individuals within the community are buried around the periphery of the mound. And at some point, um, and you often see this in the literature when people talk about it, the mound is capped over. And that's something that we want to, we've started to think about more and started to question it. Uh, this notion of capping, but I'll, so I'll say this, at some point that uh, these massive additions of soil are added to the mound that effectively cap and close the central tomb, uh, but sort of re-sculpt the shape of the mound and um, its focus. And we'll see this in, particularly in the floodplain. Uh, there are, there are hundreds and hundreds, there are countless uh, uh, essentially mounds in the lower Illinois Valley. I'm going to talk about, now, I should back up. Some of them, you see these gray dots, this is the lower half of the lower valley, the southern half. These gray dots represent sites on the bluffs. There are much larger mound sites with more, generally more complex mounds that are in the, in the uh, valley. 
or floodplain as we call it. Really they're on features in the floodplain, uh, whether they're sand ridges, uh, terrace remnants, what have you. I'm going to talk about three of these today. Uh, the Mound House site here, Camp Mound Group, and uh, Golden Eagle site. These are all sites that we've been working at. All right, before we go uh, further, is to show you um, this notion of uh, sod blocks. You can see them here, these inverted sod blocks at Mound House and at the Camp Mound Group uh, through excavation uh, was noted by uh, Julianne Van Ness, and she saw that what was called basket loads before were often individual cuts or loads of soil where the upper young soils, these upper A horizons and the B horizon below were you can see that distinctive geomorphologic feature scooped out and turned upside down into these sod rings. Now, excavating uh, mounds is challenging and difficult today for a number of ethical and legal reasons, and there's logistic reasons too, especially in the floodplain where the mounds are very large and there's a lot of soil to move before you might be able to get to the distinctive features you would want to see. So, um, one approach we've taken to addressing those problems is geophysical survey or remote sensing, which is non-destructive. It allows us to see mound structure without disturbing anything that might be in there. Um, I should mention that uh, the common interpretation of floodplain mount or mound building in general, this ramp and tomb structure, uh, particularly the prepared surface, the ramp itself, and the tomb, has been tied to sort of two explanations. Both are um, cosmological. The first of these is uh, this idea of a, you know, I'm not sure entirely how much I buy this structure anymore, but this tripartite structure of the cosmos, where there's an underworld, uh, yellow disk of this world, and then an upper world above it. And the mound and the movement of the dead body uh, is thought to move between those three uh, parts of existence. Um, the other hand, the use of sod blocks, especially new earth, and some of the other building materials that get used in mounds are associated, are thought to be associated with the earth diver story. Does anybody know this creation story? Familiar with it? This idea that the world was initially water, and that the short version is, um, for various reasons, uh, the beings, often animals, that are um, want to live on earth, uh, dive below the water and attempts to bring muck up to the surface from which the world's created. Various animals fail, uh, eventually one succeeds, as often animals that can move through two realms. Ducks and various water birds, muskrats, um, turtles, it varies from group to group. So the idea then is that the new soil, these sod blocks, are part of that um, story, or they're part of a commemoration, recreation, or enactment of world renewal. All right, so first let's turn to the Mound House site. The Mound House site is located about Mint Valley. It's in Greene County. This is an aerial photograph from Google. You can see Mound 1. There's not much left to Mound site because of um, two major factors. One, there used to be three mounds around a plaza area here. Uh, Levy building, we think, has destroyed Mound 3. Mound 2 has been plowed down quite a bit. The site is called Mound House because there was a house built on the mound uh, in the 19th century. So uh, the Center for American Archaeology and the University of New Mexico Field Schools, Chicago Field Schools, have conducted a number of excavations through here. You can see some of uh, the remnants of that in this picture. And we wanted to test out some of these remote sensing uh, approaches where we had some excavation units. One of the ideas behind uh, remote sensing is that it can uh, measure differences in the earth soil, various properties, but we need to ground truth it, or we need to be able to match what the actual stratigraphy is to what the sensors are telling us. So, here are some of the units that were excavated by various programs uh, beginning in the 90s at Mount House Mount 1. And you can see these are a little off. There's a trench here, and there's a large block where we were able to see uh, key pieces of mound structure. Basically, a primary mound here and uh, additional uh, building episodes moving southward and a large sand surface down here at the south end of the mound. So the approach we took with mound one was we tried electrical resistance tomography. And 
Electrical resistance tomography, or ERT, all it does is very simple, is, can you see the tape measure there, the white and the black cords? All it does is we set metal stakes in the ground at 50 centimeters apart, we hook this cable to it, and we fire an electrical current from probe to probe. And then every other probe, then every third probe, every, you get the idea. It builds a big trapezoid, um, basically a wedge shape of resistance readings, how well the soil is able to resist that electrical current. And those differences we use to map the inside of the map. Now, I should point out these guys here. Um, this is this is me. This is 2010. This is me and um, Dr. Jason Herman, who is our one of our collaborators on remote sensing. And Mount House at Mount House, Mount One is covered with poison ivy. It's in the bushes. <laughs> it's up the trees. The summer before, um, when we actually re-excavated a trench to do a geoengineering project, I got head to toe poison ivy, and I thought, not this year. So we asked we asked our uh, uh, maintenance, our uh, facilities manager at the time, do you have anything that will protect us with from poison ivy? And he said, how about uh, I have these Tyvek suits that are supposed to be used for painting. Hmm. Now, what we found out is uh, these were a size too small. <laughs> <laughs> and so and they would tend to rip pretty much where you didn't want them to rip or you didn't want to get poison ivy. So we're not just weirdos, we're trying to be safe too. And I'll point out, I don't know who's who in this one, but Jason and I, OJ, had, had just met earlier that week for the first time. <laughs> so it was a quick bonding process <laughs> in remote sensing. Okay. So uh, the result, though, of our effort was this. This is a transect that I showed on that map along uh, off-center, north-south, roughly, on map one. And what you can see here are these different colors. What they relate to are the, that ability to resist uh, the soil's current, uh, the current, the soil's ability to resist the electrical current. Wow. Red means it's highly resistant, which is often sand, you know, like glass is a, is a great resistor, sand's a great resistor, and blue then is soil that is less able to easily resist the current. Now, one thing to keep in mind is moisture or water will affect the resistivity of the soil, right? Because water is a great conductor. But nonetheless, uh, we end up with this section, or pseudo section. And what we're able to see is, now this is just to illustrate sort of the structure of these mounds. This is from Peak Plunk Mound 2. This is the um, primary ramp at Mount House, and here's the original surface there. And this is a couple meters below uh, the surface. So what we could see here is, we see this somewhat middling sort of uh, signature here, where we know right here this is where this profile is. And what we see is a signature that appears to match, you can see it close up down here, a primary, a primary um, ramp. Now what we're also able to see is that this highly, the, this more resistant and sort of depressed area here. Now keep in mind that the movement of water through the, through the section is going to allow uh, or change the potential for the signal, water being very conductive. But it was, it, you know, it was fairly dry and we seem to get a consistent signature. So what we're interpreting this as is a clear surface here, where probably the A horizon, which you don't see a one developed here, was stripped away. So you have this surface then this work here, a cleared surface at the mound, uh, was built on the initial part of the mound. Over to the left or the south here, uh, we have this, again, highly resistant area. And this is where we were able to, through excavation, see this uh, sand surface that was built. And it had a number of post molds around it. So it was an enclosed space that had been, where these poles had been moved a number of times. Bit pole structure, some sort of stream, or some sort of uh, activity was going on at the site. So we, you know, you can't see this very well. And the reason being is that this is built on a sand ridge, all this red, it's again, high, highly resistant. So we didn't really expect to see this, see this well, but seeing this depression um, was useful because it, allowed us, it allows us to estimate sort of the extent of this and the size of this initial structure. 
Now, what we're not able to see very well are layers in this so-called capping or massive additions to the mound. We know from excavation that there are additional sod-like uh, sod structures built on it and that there's redeposited midden on top. And they seem to be conducting the current about, about the same. Though redeposited midden, which would maybe be more conductive, is denser here. So, and I should point out then this is an old foundation. So what this allowed us to do is we consider this a success. We were able to see into the structure and see some things about it. And so the next step then would be to try to take this and investigate another site uh, where we didn't know what to expect. Now before I turn back to our, next, our other our, our, e, our ERT site, I'm going to go a little further south to the Camp Mound group um, and talk about another method we use there. And I'll come back to ERT in a bit. Um, the Camp Mound group is a series of 10 mounds that are organized around an open space that uh, we, uh, the original excavators, uh, have called a plaza. It probably is. Uh, Stuart Strieber excavated here in the 60s, and in fact, this was the first lower Illinois River Valley excavation of what would become uh, CAA. And so um, we went back there on what turned out to be, we had planted our 60th anniversary. Um, and we did some remote sensing there. We didn't do ERT. ERT would have been nice for Mound 8, which is heavily wooded, but we wanted to try some other methods that we had been using. So what we're going to focus on are mounds six and seven parts of the plaza and some of these mounds out here. Now in the 20s, these were excavated uh, by uh, Taylor and his group. And I should point out that a number of these mounds, including mounds one, mound two, uh, they didn't think there was anything worth investigating, that they'd been excavated or looted, and that they couldn't, they didn't see much worth documenting. So what we did this time uh, is we used <coughs> magnetometry. And magnetometry, rather than creating a pseudo section, gives us a plan view map. And all it's doing is measuring variation in the Earth's magnetic field, so close to the surface there. And basically, these um, it's, this difference is measured in nanotesla. And so the dark end is high, uh, the lighter end is low. What we're looking for is differences. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that historic um, some historic items, including uh, ferrous metal, will interfere with the magnetometer. Uh, and areas of high contrast can be metal, but they can, all, can, they can also be burned areas. And that's something that we would have to test through excavation. We have not excavated at the Camp Mount here. But some things stand out. We see it gets very busy through here, out here in the plaza. We have this large high contrast anomaly or feature, which is where uh, Stuart Strieber excavated. That's his area eight. But what stood out to us uh, is mound six and seven, these twin mounds, we saw much more detail than we anticipated. Much more, and then, then again at mound one. What we, what we see, uh, what we think we see, and this has been published recently in the Mid-Continental Journal uh, of Archaeology, is you can see in plan view what appears to be um, the outline of at least the core part of the mound and a central tomb. This gets very complex. We can see this boundary here, and you can see where this mound, part of mound seven, seven, A and B, appears to truncate this one, which we're interpreting as one, an addition being built on the other. Oftentimes, for example, at Peak Clunk Mound 2, you have multiple tombs uh, superposed on top of each other. Now, uh, we haven't tested this. We're not ex going to excavate this. Uh, the landowner doesn't want to do excavation. It's very close to a busy highway. It's close to 100 and we don't, we're not sure how well we could secure the site. Uh, people would see what we are doing. You know, we leave every day. So right now, this is, this is as far as we'll take this, but this is informative. We're able to see these areas of difference and we think this high contrast area may be from uh, the building material used. Remember uh, sod blocks, and these are some examples of the way tombs can play out, um, are these loads of soil that are something like they've scooped it out and turned it upside down. 
And when it gets turned upside down, it exposes the e-horizon soil, which in general is less magnetic than topsoil. Remember, the topsoil is facing down. We think that, or speculate that this might have something to do with the signature. Julianne Van Ness uh, did some pouring at this site and detected evidence of sod blocks in, in both of these mounds. So we felt, feel fairly confident in interpreting it that way. We didn't expect to see anything of mound one, uh, given the reports that there was nothing left of it. In fact, it's a very subtle rise on the landscape. So we were able to see that. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to do mound 10, which would have been nice. Uh, that's a different landowner, and he didn't like that. So we were able to see, uh, using that technique, at least some structure of the mound. We're working on how it is that we can interpret that. Um, how are we doing the time? We're fine. Okay. Um, all right. Now I'm going to jump down to the Golden Eagle site. This is where we've been excavating recently. And the Golden Eagle site uh, is here at the south end of the county, and I'll show close-up to this. But what makes this unique is the fact that it not only has mounds, you can see one of them there, one, two, three, but it also has a, uh, an earthen enclosure around it. During the Middle Woodland period in the mid-continent, so further east, say in Ohio, uh, is those sites are well known for their large earthwork enclosures around those mound sites. In the lower Illinois Valley, uh, we don't have those, except at Golden Eagle. And uh, it's been known about since, I may have taken this one. Oh. It's been known about since the, oh, uh, the late 1800s um, when uh, McAdams reported, he had these throwaway, almost throwaway sentences like this. Uh, it's a little singular, although you know, on the mounds in the Great American Bottom can contain such a great array. I know of a one single embankment or enclosure, and that was discovered a short time ago in the county of Calhoun, Illinois, near the mouth of the Illinois River. Other than his statements about that, that's pretty much all the information we had till about the 60s when archaeologists at the CAA were starting to look through aerial photographs and relocated the site. Now, there have been surface collections, uh, intermittent surface collections, not um, total surface pickups, of the site, and there's been a number of maps that were drawn in the 70s. And so the basic um, outline of the site is they noted that there was embankment, perhaps with some breaks in it. There are mounds. There's actually one here, one there, and another one actually more out here. Uh, there's been a number of different drawings and recordings of this. The only real view of the buried portion of the site from the 70s was uh, there was an erosion ditch at the edge of the site that the landowner allowed them to sort of clean up, scrape away with a trowel and shovel and make a sketch map. And so we kind of reproduced it here. You get the general idea. They reported that the embankment sort of on the east side of the site was gold sand, and then a layer of gray sand capping it off, and they found a feature between, but there was nothing diagnostic in it. It was sort of general mid-debris, and nothing about it told them about time. The problem of time is, is a real big one at Golden Eagle. All right. So, um, and I'll point out then, they uh, designated as distinct from the Golden Eagle site, uh, the Topmeyer site, which is a scattered of, scatter of late woodland debris sort of at the south end of, of the site. Okay, so we're able to, we're able to get the LIDAR um, data from the state for, for Golden Eagle, for Calhoun County. And what this, what this map is showing us is basically it's, you know, a combination contour map. Basically these light areas are very high, darker, or low. And we were able to match this up with this aerial photograph of the site. What you can see is, can you see the embankment there? You can see a piece of it potentially here. A very large mound, uh, another mound at the center, and a smaller mound sort of in this hiatus. Now, there's a low area through here, which we think is a ditch. Which you can see right there. It gets kind of fuzzy through here, and you can pick it up again there. Uh, for reference, that erosion uh, ditch on the east side of the site that they cleaned up in the 70s is through here. We tried to relocate it, 
we think we found it and it's packed full of metal and like an old refrigerator, an old stove, and junk. So remote sensing near that, at least with a magnetometer, won't, won't work well. Uh, archaeologists that have talked about the site and done walkovers uh, have, have suggested there may be as many as two, two, one and two to eight mounds. We've kind of hypothesized that there's definitely one here, one here, and maybe three, four, uh, five and six up here, and these two being the least uh, likely. So uh, what we did, and this was supported by uh, a National Geographic Society uh, Wake Grant, um, we proposed to do some remote sensing, and we went out in December, and this was a this was a volunteer crew. I should mention that um, the earlier work that I was talking about was all done by uh, staff and the field school students, university field schools. Uh, these were all volunteers, and we went out in December, and it was and it was miserably cold. It, for most of the time we were out there, it was, it was just in the teens. But everybody everybody uh, worked really hard on troops. And so this is I want to throw this in. This is the magnetometer here, so that gets your magnetic signature. We've done GPR out there, which you can see there being dragged, and that's just fires a radar way through the ground and reads reflections. And here's the ERT being set up at mount one. Okay. Uh, we did magnetometry across a good portion of the site. Now, Golden Eagle site, and something to keep in mind, is can you see a, sort of a seam or the difference in the land through here? These are two different landowners. This half of the site is actively farmed, and so um, that landowner doesn't want a lot of excavation or disturbance of the soil because he's trying to make a living. This northern half of the site, though, uh, is in a program to keep it out of production. He's very open to us doing archaeology out there. So we did magnetometry out there. Now, what you're seeing again are these differences. And the differences that we see are, well, you can see the embankment part of it through here. Can you see that? Can you see part of the ditch and embankment here? Um, you can't quite see mound one, mound two, doesn't show up great at, at this scale. The, this area through here is all woods, and so we didn't, magnetometer doesn't work well in the woods. So we didn't go out there. Um, now, so our first step in trying to analyze this is we try to find these areas of difference that might be the result of human activity, areas where there's things have been burned, where the soil's been turned, something is disrupted in the past, uh, the Earth's magnetic field. And that could be historic or prehistoric. So when we got these results, and um, Jason Herbert again sketched these in, so these are kind of hypotheses that we might want to ground truth. And you can see that he was able to see some patterns. It gets a little busy around mound two. You see something at mound three, mound four, not so much at mounds five and six. But we were kind of surprised at how few features or anomalies we saw in the magnetic data. And so I threw, I want to show you, um, in, in contrast, uh, the Mount House site. We jump back to Mount House for a second. This is magnetic data from Mount House. Now there are a lot of high contrast features which are metal, but you see how busy it is through here? These are areas of uh, high density of debris, and they correspond with areas of when we've excavated, where we have, and these are sort of in the middle of excavation, uh, relative, some of them very large, but features with lots of artifacts, almost complete pottery, <coughs> Uh, features that are laid at the bottom of them and sides are layered with broken pottery. So Madhouse, there's a lot of debris, a lot of uh, magnetic busyness to the data. At Golden Eagle, not so much. And that's, that's going to be a problem for us. So let's go through just some of the stuff that we've done. And Mad 1, we did uh, the ERT again. And this should look familiar to you, right? We did a transit now, uh, as an aside, our original plan was to do uh, multiple transects through here, but because it was icing that day, or threatened to ice, the FedEx delivery guy decided that Calhoun County was too far to drive in that weather in the evening, and so he marked that nobody was there to pick it up, though we were. 
and, and came back to the nearby to here depot center. So the next day we had to go drive and get it. Um, it cost us a few days of work, um, which is unfortunate because we rent this stuff and it rents by the day, even ship days. Um, anyway, so we were able to get our one transect though, and it turned out it turned out well. And you see this uh, again, the, a similar array of stakes. And we get a similar signature. We can see, um, and we found out later, this is before we've done any excavation, that it's a very sandy substrate of the site. So we have a highly resistant area here, which is the original surface. It's very, uh, it's very sandy there, so that's not a surprise. We see a depression, which is probably a central tomb. The um, base, of, base of it may be flat, but sometimes there are smaller features in there. We can see. Um, this very much less resistant area here, which we're interpreting as ramps, and then uh, additional building on top. Now, it was, when we collected these data, it was sort of icing sleeting a little bit. And so, unlike the Mount House data, where the historic structures were highly resistant, um, there's a historic uh, the foundation here of an old building, a barn at the edge of the mound, and it trapped all, all of that water, so it shows up as less resistant. And we may have a piece of the embankment. One question is, is how far out does the mound actually go, and where does the embankment begin, if the embankment actually extends that far? We need to, we're gonna do some test units out there at some point. So that worked out well. It matched up with what we saw in our known case, and then in our unknown, we were able to see again the sort of distinctive structure of a middle woodland mound. So far, so good. Um, when it came time to do excavation, because we had no plans to excavate uh, Mound 1 proper, we decided what we would do would move over here uh, to the embankment. And we wanted to get part of the built up area and the ditch. And we were doubting whether or not Mound, mound 5 is actually a mound. We still sort of doubt that. And um, as part of our program out there, before and during our remote sensing period. Um, oh, let me just remind you that this is what we knew about in the embankment beforehand. Gold sand may be a feature in between gray sand. Um, we did GPR out there. So this is a ground penetrating radar uh, profile or um, basically what this is, is we drag the instrument across the surface, it's been corrected for the surface, the radar wave reflects off of uh, surf certain surfaces and features in the ground. And what we were able to see was, we had this very reflect, highly reflective area here, which we interpreted as embankment fill, and you can see this lower area through here as a ditch. Uh, we have this hard reflection here, we didn't know what that was. Um, and so this appears, we're, we're hypothesizing as the original surface. And so this is a bit of the plasma. Disregard these numbers, those I'm not sure those are entirely right. Nonetheless, we thought we saw basic ditch and embankment. Now, here's the ditch, here's the embankment. If you were to look at one at the radar data in plain view, looking down, highly reflective here. The ditch, not so much, but you can see an edge of the ditch. And we we're excited we we're going to do some units. Um, we placed our units in the uh, along the embankment. Here it is superimposed over some magnetic data. Uh, we turned them off of true north because we wanted to be able to hit this at a right angle. And so we started the summer with just five, we did that summer just five units. And this is the University Field School uh, did this. And what we were able to find is in the embankment, is this turning out, can you see the layers through there? You can see that there are these light layers and these hard, dark, uh, sort of laminated appearance to this. We started to, we started to see this. Um, in the embankment fill, or in the embankment proper. This is Mount uh, Square One that's right sort of in the center. And there was a lot of debate then in the field, is this natural or cultural? You know, we, had, we have to weave this out. Now, as we move towards the edge of the embankment, we saw that uh, there's a little bit of change to it. We saw this pattern, but we saw that it got thinner and sort of feathered out. Can you see that? And this other material on top of that. There. 
And so what we interpreted that as is uh, embankment and some, or at least primary embankment film, and some sort of building episode on top of that that extended it. And you can see here, this up here is the plow zone. Uh, this is how it looked as we excavated down into it. It was a very model. Um, and when we hit it, we thought, oh, this is sort of sandy. It's very sandy out there. It's very easy to dig. And it seems to be loaded. So we were pretty excited about that, you know, not having excavated here before. I will point out, though, that can you see that and that? Now, when we were doing the original remote sensing out there, walking around, there was a lot of plastic. But in the creek nearby, there's a spot where people had been not the landowner dumping trash, and we thought the plastic was from that. So we started excavating then the next summer, we started finding lots and lots of plastic. And so our thought was, or at least my worry was here's excavating, is like, oh no, all of Gold Needle is just a trash dump. It seems like all we're finding as we dig deeper and deeper is plastic. And it goes, it goes down, you know, 25, 30 centimeters. You may know it all the plastic why you might find lots of plastic, what's farmed with plastic. Was that? Not, well, we thought maybe it was related to that. It turned out it, it's watermelons. It's very sandy soil, and they would use, they pull long sheets of plastic to keep, I guess, the weeds down and the watermelon grow through. We had no idea, but we'd find great big pieces. Uh, the farmer told us apparently it's supposed to degrade if you just leave it out, but if you bury it, it doesn't. So we found a lot of it. Um, I, that is probably the most common artifact, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yes. So, okay. Uh, but, so we interpret this as embankment fill, maybe a secondary building episode here that is a little more homogeneous. Underneath the plastic you plow fill. Uh, we were excited, though, in that first year at the edge of the, the ditch. It's a little bit dark there, but can you see this? We started to see a feature. Now, the feature, I'll point out right away, is very, has very sharp boundaries, which was a red flag, but it had this clay material in it, which we hadn't encountered yet, and we were finding charcoal in it, and, you know, some disturbances. And we're like, well, okay, we haven't found any artifacts. <clears throat> that summer we didn't really find much in the way of artifacts, but we were finding this feature. And, of course, the students were excited about it. You can see charcoal in it. So we're like, all right, maybe we found a feature. Um, but the worry was it was very had very sharp boundaries. And you can see here that it appears to be a little water laid, and it's very sharp boundaries through here. So uh, here's the feature, and um, we had a little le money left over from the grant. I took three radiocarbon samples and said, you know, what the heck? Let's send them off. And as you can see here, um, they're not they're not prehistoric. So. We talked later to the landowner, his family, the landowner to the south, who had been, his family's been there since pretty much people started living in Calhoun County. And he didn't remember anything uh, distinct about that sort of area where we were in in the ditch, but we suspect that at some point part of the ditch had been re-excavated in modern time uh, to facilitate water flow because it dips sort of down now towards a drainage, a different drainage creek. But he did, uh, mentioned to us that near one of the mounds he thinks they buried it. He thinks they buried a cow. So <laughs> we hope we don't find that. Alright, so this is this is the embankment in our area of remote sensing and maybe they are trying to facilitate drinking there. So um, and we think we found an embankment. Well, we found an embankment so far so good. But we we needed to do more. Um, Oh, this is just sort of a reminder of sort of the basic idea. So we have this highly reflective area that kind of terminates where our units do, where we can see that there is something reflective, that banding. And I'm going to come back to that in a bit. And that we have this ditch, we need to explore that a little more, and we have maybe a historic feature. Beneath this, and I didn't have a slide of it, uh, there's very deep in the units, uh, below the sand, uh, the soil is very clay, it's very dense. And after talking to a few folks, that we suspected, or this is this area that's very clay down here, sort of clay substrate that the sandy portion of the site is on, is uh, the clay that was laid down before, um, sort of during, when this part of the Illinois River was really Lake Calhoun, that the outlet of the Illinois River was dammed much before 
uh, human occupation. So it's, it's very hard and very uh, difficult to excavate through, but somebody tries every summer so far. They regret it as soon as they start. So what do, what do we see here? We see that we have what is possibly loading. Uh, we don't really have the gray part of it. And we certainly didn't have any prehistoric features. And we didn't find much in the way of artifacts. We weren't terribly surprised because uh, the mound fills often aren't artifact rich, but we were kind of hoping you know, we get a feature. Uh, at least something to give us a sense of time. Now, uh, the next year we moved over a little bit and we put a transecting units through here to see, you know, what does the embankment look like in this area. And you can see them here, and we sort of spaced them out. The idea was to get a view inside, along the embankment, and outside of it, in the unit here in the ditch. Now, uh, this is sort of about mid-embankment. We're seeing a similar sort of structure. We see what we are wondering, or thinking, is uh, based on the other units. Two is an initial surface, possibly excavated into here. There's actually a magnetic anomaly that uh, correlates with that. Uh, we see what is this busy area here and then plows it. Now, I don't remember. Okay. So one of the questions, does this go back? He may go back. One of the questions we had, and I mentioned this earlier, is what's natural and what's not? Because it's important, just general in archaeology, but it's also important for us uh, this is our last remaining candidate for a enclosure in the Illinois River Valley. There is the Ogden Fetty site in the Central Valley, which my understanding now is that, talking to Mike Wyant, is that it's not definitely not a uh, human structure, at least the enclosure there. So this is our last chance of sort of having a middle wood, woodland enclosure. It's fine if it's not one, but we need to know. Because we talk about it uh, as a group, archaeologists, quite a bit in the literature. These could be building episodes, or something similar to loading using sandy soil. Uh, there's one hypothesis where you're getting at the interface of these building episodes, the accumulation of clays. These darker areas tend to be clayier, they're a little rustier, they're a little denser. All in all, this is mostly all very soft sand. Again, it's fun, it's fun to excavate through, and it's very easy to excavate through. Another possibility, though, is that these are what we call BT horizons, and these are that form an actually uh, very old sand deposits, such as sand dunes, which this portion of the landform has remnant sand dunes on. Which raise, so bring, raises two questions. Is this natural, all of this banding natural, and all of this addition of height to the landscape that we're interpreting as embankment, is all that natural? We don't really find, though, oval shape natural patterns too much like that? Or do we have a natural feature that prehistoric people were adding to? They often built their mounds in the bluff crest and the floodplain on sand ridges and knolls and raised surfaces. So are they accentuating an existing landform or are we seeing an anthropogenic um, soil? Now, uh, we're working on doing sampling for formal testing of that. So far, the consultation from a number of different uh, experts in soils has given us Sort of, yeah, maybe for the whole range of explanations. So we're going to find out, though. But that's something to keep in mind. And we don't have charcoal at the site, except for that unfortunate historic charcoal. So uh, what we did, uh, and you can, I, before it goes forward, this isn't the excavator's fault. We had a bad rain, and uh, it blew out their water. unfortunately. We took some OSL data, so optically stimulated luminescence. Uh, what this will do is we took these, our, we have our hypothesized sort of stratigraphy here. We took these samples uh, from the soil and basically pounded a PVC pipe that's six inches long, six inches in diameter in there. And we got a sample of soil in those three places that are unexposed to sunlight. Because what the OSL will do, will measure the last time this uh, quartz was exposed to sunlight. So we can measure time in that way. It's not quite as tight or precise a date as radiocarbon dating, but you know it's pretty good. 
um, and it's better than nothing, right? And so this is a, it's a, great, it's a great approach for this kind of sandy soil, especially because we don't have any carbon and we're not finding artifacts in this. So we sent off, these, these two we should be the same, this one should be younger, right? So we've sent these off, we're waiting on the results for that. I was hoping to have results back by now to tell you about, so we don't know. Um, but those will go a long way in telling us about uh, time, and, and potentially about uh, human action out there, because if these are old enough to be sand dunes, or we can rule out this as being anthropogenic, and maybe start looking at this. So to be continued on that point. Um, but again, as you move away from the center of the embankment, moving northward, you can see this feathers out in a sort of predictable way. As you get away from it down into the embankment, I mean the ditch, you don't see any of that. You see the natural soil, you see this accumulation of organics that's been disturbed. There are a lot of roots, there's a lot of rotor burrows, there's a rock, not in a lot of way of debris. We did start finding more debris in 2015. Lamellar blade cores, which is a middle woodland item. We found some middle woodland points. We've also found some archaic points. We found some Mississippian points, and we found some late woodland points. All in the plow zone, except for a few of the archaic ones that were well below what we would think would be the middle woodland occupation of it. So we have a little bit of the whole time spectrum, not in any great density, and not in any context that helps us pin down when certain things were built. Oh, no, it's wrong. Now, just to the north, uh, and this helps us with our case for uh, human-made structure, just to the north, outside of the embankment, it's relatively flat out there. And you can see the A horizon, or the plow zone, you can see the plastic, you can see then we have all natural uh, soil column here. But if you look at the bottom of this, very quickly we get to this highly weathered uh, surface through here that are strata that we don't find this high in the other units. So we're, we're hypothesizing then that this relatively flat area outside of the enclosure was scraped away and used to build the embankment. Generally, we find this clay or stuff a little bit deeper. All right, and finally, this summer we went to Mound 2. And again, we had GPR out here. Um, uh, we have magnetic data. You can see the boundaries of Mound 2. Uh, this is just the topography. You can see some of this high contrast stuff through here. This is, and this is very high contrast. If you notice between five, and was that, negative five, uh, nanoteslas, there's not a lot of variation in the magnet, magnetic data at Golden Eagle. Part of it, I think, is because of the sand. And I don't have slides for this, but some of the units we did outside of the mound, there was no A horizon or only, a very, only very little. So we suspect that it's mostly been plowed away and we're not preserving the things that would cause a, a normal magnetic signature. But GPR worked out here. And so you can see uh, the mound. So at about 40 centimeters below the surface, we have a highly reflective area that you can see there. And then at about 180, we see this void uh, that sort of lines up with that. If we look at this in section, you can see the reflections here that seem to form the mound, the surface, and this depression here. Um, so we hypothesize that we have basically um, sort of a middle woodland-like structure to the mound, where we have a primary mound, perhaps a cleared initial primary or cleared surface at the bottom, the surface it was built on, uh, and a cap. Now, one question that we continue to ask, if that was the case, or before we excavated this, where did all this extra soil come from? I have to answer that another time. We put some units in in 2015 and this past summer. Um, this, this just shows you in relation to the reflective areas. And the next one shows it in, uh, it's a little easier to see. And I'm going to focus mostly on these because these had no evidence of mound fill in at all. Now, when we get to, uh, this is sort of um, north over here. This is south. And so we're just going to focus on this one. You can see a fairly distinct area where you see this sort of laminated deposits again that appear to correlate with the boundaries of the mound. Um, it's now finer layers than over at the embankment fill at the north end of the site, if you can see that difference. But it's through here. It actually gets much stronger in this thicker load, loaded area through there. And then we have an initial 
initial surface through there. Uh, outside, this is just east of these units. Uh, you can see you have a plow zone and you don't find any of this sort of banded fill through there. So, um, what we're seeing at least, where we have raised areas within the site, whether it's the embankment in different parts or at least Mount 2, we see a, a distinctive sort of signature that looks like, um, doesn't look like anything else we've seen in Middle Woodland or Hopewell Mounds. Now the ERT results from Mound 2 we're fairly confident in do have that sort of structure. So the question is then, why are we seeing uh, these differences? Are these entirely anthropogenic or human made? And if they are, and if they are Middle Woodland, one thing about Middle Woodland sites, if you're familiar with it, is they often, maybe not in the Mount Fills directly, but associated sites have quite a bit of debris, and including pottery which I haven't mentioned yet, because we haven't found any yet. So, we have a lot of questions about Golden Eagle, um, and not a lot of answers yet. But, what this remote sensing has allowed us to do is to create sort of a database of imagery without disturbing too much of the soil of what the structures might look like. We, ground truthing is still important, or creating a second data set to help us interpret what we're seeing in the remote sensing data that we can then use at other sites. Um, but it, you know, we continue to have questions that excavation are gonna to have to answer. And I don't have answers um, for most of the most interesting questions yet, we'll maybe have a little more. In 2017, um, when the high school field school and the university field school comes out, um, camp school. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Answer. <laughs> um, why would they build ramps inside a mound? What would be the purpose of a ramp? So a ramp, ramp, the ramp and tomb is the name that Gregory Prino gave them in the literature. Um, it, it's sort of a, mis a misleading name. It is a ramp, but think of it as encircling the whole thing. So this is how they would walk up and access the tomb to put people into it. Um, Think of it like if you have your rectangular log tomb and like a donut set around it, but except it sort of never stops. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. You spoke uh, right at the start about finding post holes, I believe you said. Did you, speak, did you say post holes? Yes. Because most of the, all the logs in your pictures are horizontal. So are they both horizontal limb structures and vertical? The, the post molds that I, that I was referring to, those were found during excavation in Mount House. Yes. Those were found during excavation in starting in 94, and those were regular sort of you know, horizontal looking down post molds. What, at the south end of the site, what they found, uh, and this is before my time, but what they found was that there was a sand surface that was it up to about 10 centimeters thick in places, and around the margins of it were at least three concentric uh, arcs of post molds that it looked like that they had been in place and pulled or and then replaced because they had different sand fills in it. And we think that that was a screen or big pole structure that had been built around that. Maybe the center of it moved, but it was enclosing that sort of sand space. We don't see post mold. Something unless they were really big, something that small, we're not going to be able to pick up in the magnetic data or the magnetic data. Those are reading at um, a half meter interval. So. This is a silly question, but what tools did you use to dig the main wall so nice and flat? <laughs> Neat. <laughs> um, high school and college students. <laughs> no. I, they did. They did. They they've done a great job excavating those. They used um, sharpened shovels and sharpened hand trowels. Carefully, carefully, uh, you know, carefully. We we've, we've been we've been um, archaeology is not you know the, the skills of basic field excavation and good basic field excavation is something I think that anyone can can master with practice. And we've also been very fortunate, and the folks that have come through our programs have really made a concerted effort to do the best they can, and really, and really have grasped the reasons why. Because you know, 
when you excavate, you're destroying the context that you're trying to study. So we sort of have a responsibility to do it the best we can. That's what we try to tell our students because everybody after you is going to count on what you did and how you reported it. They've done it. They've done a good job. That's all by hand. Are you now entertaining alternative hypotheses to this being a middle woodland um, ceremony center, or do you just think it's a different kind of uh, a middle woodland ceremony? Um. I am open to whatever it is. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's possible, right? I, I, the, we've kind of gone in with the assumption that the entirety of the site is all middle women, right? But, you know, on the face of it, is there any reason to think so? You know, uh, sort of, this is the same with the floodplain boundary groups. The assumption is that there, now how many floodplain boundary groups have we really excavated in any detail? compared to bluff, bluff press, not that many, right? And so certainly there are plenty of them, but you know, the idea is that, well, it's got mounds and enclosure, it must be a middle of the site. And so what I'm open to is the possibility that we have uh, landscapes that have great time depth and that maybe were modified more than once. And, I, and I'll give an example of uh, the camp mound group. The camp mound group is those 10 mounds, by definition, and it's that plaza around it, and it's a middle woodland site because it has mounds, and, you know, middle woodland mounds. Mound 9 has radio carbonates as a middle woodland mound, and it looks like one. Um, there's also quite a bit of late woodland pottery at that site in between the mounds. And just outside of the boundaries of the middle woodland site are, at the base of the bluff are this Parents Ledge crematory, and there's another one crematory next to it. So my question, sort of questioning this is, what is the real boundary of the site as it might have been perceived, especially as space changed over time? Is that? There's a middle wheel component for sure in that one. I don't know the rest. We're still hoping, you know, that if it, if it is, it fits into the narrative we as archaeologists have built. If it doesn't, that's very too. It looked like Golden Eagle had the one, two, three mile lined up. Yes. Can they go to any uh, lunar or solar alignment? That we haven't tried to line that, but we've we've talked about that too. It's it, they they do pretty much line up along an axis there, and they um, sort of divide the two halves of the site, or not along north south, but you know they're they're two almost in half, directly in half. We haven't tried to align it yet. Okay, thanks again, Jason. Thank you. One more question. You mentioned the creation story, the animals bringing mud up from the bottom. So are the mounds an extension of that building up to the sky? Um, that's been interpreted, yes, kind of. And it's been interpreted a couple of ways, right? The idea is generally is that it's some sort of reenactment or um, commemoration of that as sort of a, ceremony, a group ceremony, a collective ceremony, a communal ceremony. Um, and I, uh, this idea, some of it go, goes back to Robert Hall uh, arguing that it's part of these sort of renewal ceremonies. You know, reading into some of the, some of the literature, some of the, from where he drew those analogies, um, you know, we're starting to think about it now as not just a reenactment, but a sort of enactment of renewal and rebirth that it was a time of literal, literal sort of creation again. But yes, I mean it is. It, I, we, it's, I think that they're not just piling up soil and piling up soil. It's meaning very meaningful and perhaps important to sort of continuing society. Okay, just a reminder: we do have the flyers here at the table. We have the uh, upcoming uh, lectures and the calendar of events for the year. There's some free posters here. Feel free to take any of those. But again, thank you, Jason. Thank, thank you all you. for coming. Thank you.